Good morning and welcome to Hanover's first in a series of three webinars covering culture, diversity and inclusion. Today we are delighted to be joined by Dr. Funky Abambola, MBE, who is going to talk about intersectionality and the challenges and opportunities navigating the corporate world as a black female and mother. My name is Zoe Campbell. I'm a partner within the insurance practice and culture inclusion and diversity ambassador at Hanover. I will be your facilitator for the event. To kick things off, here are a few housekeeping points. Firstly, this event will be recorded and will be hosted on YouTube to enable us to house the recording on our website. The recordings of all three webinars will be sent to all attendees following the last event on the 29th of September. Timings. Following a brief introduction about Hanover and Dr. Funky Abambola, who will speak for about 20 minutes with a shared presentation. We will then ask a few direct questions and open the event up to the floor, finishing by 11.30 a.m. The Zoom call is set up so everyone except the key host will set to be set to mute. So please check you are muted to save any interference. If you have a question or comment, please write this in the chat box within the Zoom application. My colleague Andrew Watson, a member of Hanover's Diversity and Inclusion Committee, will be monitoring this and will present your questions to Dr. Funky Abambola during the Q&A session. We cannot guarantee all questions raised will be answered, but we hope to cover the main themes arising. Funky has kindly said she will be open to connecting with people from the event if appropriate. For those who don't know Hanover, we are a global provider of talent solutions with 25 years experience in three distinct lines of business. Executive search, helping organizations find business leaders and subject matter experts. Secondly, our leadership consulting business helps organizations to increase the performance and fulfill the potential of their leaders and teams. Thirdly, our market intelligence capability provides actionable insights as such as salary benchmarking and competitor assessments. Our head office is in London and we have locations across East and West Coast USA, Europe and Asia. Put simply, Hanover's expertise is in helping clients to find the best people to maximize their potential. As part of our drive to raise awareness of the multifaceted issues across the culture, inclusion and diversity landscape, we are running these sessions to share knowledge, begin conversations and deepen our engagement with clients. So please forgive us in advance if we approach you afterwards to make inquiries about how we may be able to help you and your organization with our talent solutions. So as a brief introduction to our speaker today, Dr. Funky Abambola is a performance-driven C-suite leader having traversed large complex matrix organizations from corporate law to the pharma industry with 20 years global experience. Funky is a recognized equality, diversity and inclusion leader in March 2019, she was appointed as a champion for action as part of Grant Thornton International's Global Diversity Campaign. She has recently become a member of the All Party, Party Parliamentary Group for Governance and Inclusive Leadership and is a regular media, media contributor for the BBC. Her leadership and influence has also been recognised by the Financial Times and the Prime Minister awarded her Point Light status due to the positive impact of her work on equality, inclusion and diversity. So on that note, Funky, over to you. Thanks very much indeed. I'm absolutely delighted to be part of this series. Um, so, so important that we talk about these issues. And intersectionality is, is an expression that only fairly recently uh, came to the fore, that, you know, how do you juggle multiple identities at the same time and remain impactful as a leader. So I'm going to share my story, lessons learnt, uh, and talk around a, a number of the core themes uh, that have really shaped my leadership. And in common with Hanover, when you talk about maximizing potential, that really is what I'm all about. So the first layers of identity come from the many, many different hats that I wear. So I am a practicing solicitor still. Uh, I've been practicing for almost 20 years now. Um, I am a leader, uh, quite aside from that, a, a business leader. I've worked for a very, very large organisations. I did work for the world's uh, largest biotech uh, company. Uh, I'm a public speaker. I do a lot of talking around uh, all, all aspects of leadership, really. But I do integrate diversity and inclusion and quality into everything I do. I'm a diversity champion. I mentor uh, extensively. 
I'm regularly on the BBC. I'm one of their expert uh, contributors. So I'm often on BBC One, uh, ridiculously early in the morning when I'm far too tired to really appreciate uh, that I'm on national television. Uh, the hat that's most important of all, and trumps all of these hats, and most all-encompassing, uh, is I'm a very proud mother. And, and here's the proof, because uh, a lot of people find it very hard to reconcile the woman that they see and hear uh, with being a mother. But I am a mother. His name is Max. He's going to be 18 uh, later on this year. He is downstairs currently, looking forward to starting back at school. Uh, he's going into his final year uh, of school and, of course, has been affected um, but everything, you know, education and interruptions and so on. But I'm very, very proud of him. There's a slight uh, hint as to what he wants to do in the future in the picture. He's a future software engineer uh, and he's had lots of work experience at Google and, and places like that. So key part of my identity is being a mother. And it's something that isn't always obvious uh, when people first meet me, which is why I talk about my son all the time, because I wanted to be very, very clear that I am a mother and it's a key part of how I lead and, and what's shaped my leadership over time. Another layer of my identity. So we begin to see the theme of intersectionality really coming to the fore here. I'm actually British Nigerian. I wasn't born in the UK, so the accent is slightly misleading. Um, and this is very much uh, part of having been born into a privileged upper middle class Nigerian family. Uh, I moved to the UK when I was eight, purely for educational purposes. I was incredibly fortunate uh, to be privately educated throughout. A, a tremendous sacrifice, I hasten to add, from my father, uh, who was a doctor, had to work incredibly hard to uh, educate myself and two younger siblings privately. But that's how I came to, to come to the UK. So I was a Nigerian born. Um, I became a British citizen uh, almost 20 years ago. So I have dual citizenship and I like to embrace both cultures, again, as part of my leadership. I'm very proud of my Nigerian roots, but I also have imbibed uh, very you know, core elements of the British culture. I'm very, very proud of that. Now, my son is actually British born. So again, there's a slight nuance there where he's British born. He was born in South East London uh, and later acquired his Nigerian passport. So it was, it was the other way around, but he similarly has been brought up to embrace his Nigerian identity and the core elements of being British because he's actually uh, British born. Now, I mentioned that my father was a doctor. Medicine runs very, very deep uh, in our family. He's not the only doctor in the family. So my mother's also a doctor, three younger siblings are also doctors, aunts, uncles, etc. Now, I'm talking to you as a solicitor and a business leader. So what happened there? I had a very interesting discussion with my father when I was 16. I didn't want to do medicine, but because he was paying my school fees, I was terrified to tell him this. I was so worried that he might not support um, my, my non-medical aspirations, as it were. I'm the eldest child in a Nigerian family, and with that comes a huge weight of responsibility and leadership. And my dad was actually quite concerned that I might influence younger siblings not to do medicine. He ran a very large private hospital uh, in Nigeria and was very well known uh, for being a you know, renowned uh, physician. So it wasn't part of the plan for his daughters to suddenly announce that not only did she not want to do medicine, but she actually wanted to do law. And dad knew nothing about law. So it was a real issue. I had to get lots of people involved, school teachers, my mum begging and pleading and so on. It sounds odd to say this now, but I think my father's reactions were driven by fear. But this turning point was so critical in my leadership development. I can see that looking back now because I was determined to prove to my father that in supporting me, he'd made the right decision. Uh, and he did support me at tremendous cost. He paid for my A-levels that he didn't want me to do. He wanted me to do science A-levels. Of course, I was now doing English literature, uh, history and economics. He paid for my law degree as an overseas student at Newcastle University, again, when he'd assumed I was going to be doing medicine. So it was a big thing for him, but his one condition was that I had to become one of the top lawyers in the country. So with that one exception, I was free to jaunt off and do what I wanted within law. Um, but joking aside, he was very, very, very supportive. I graduated, went back to Nigeria for what I thought was going to be a summer break after graduation. I ended up staying far longer. Uh, almost three years, in fact, uh, because at this stage, finances were a lot tougher for my father and I had to take a hit for the team. I had younger siblings who hadn't done GCSE, hadn't done A-level, 
And I, whilst I was in Nigeria, I did the Nigerian bar, qualified in Nigeria, and then came back to the UK thinking that it would be really, really easy for me to, to qualify in the UK. And I faced lots and lots of hurdles in doing so. Now, over a period of time, I began to realize that the playing field was not level and that it wasn't enough somehow that I had this outstanding education, top grades, I've been to Russell Group University. The fact that I was a visible minority, in fact, the fact that my name was obviously African became very, very clear that this was a real issue. This was a real issue for the law firms I was writing to, uh, to apply. I applied for so many CVs and covering letters. And it's what we now call unconscious bias, or in some cases, conscious bias, really, or, or blatant discrimination. But I was comparing myself to uh, my peers who had anglicized names. Many of them were actually West Indian, and they would get past the first hurdle, at least. They would apply and at least get an interview. I was even, even getting that, and I had top grades. So out of sheer desperation, I picked up the phone and I started phoning these law firms direct. I literally drew up a list of the top 150 law firms and in-house legal departments. I found out the names of everyone that ran the corporate team because I wanted to become a corporate lawyer. And I cold called them. I had a sales pitch about myself. Um, and I, you know, within a minute, I was able to persuade quite a large number of these senior leaders to invite me in for an exploratory discussion. And that was how ultimately I got my foot in the door, but it left a very bad taste in my mouth because I realized that I had to put in that extra effort. There's a lot of data that backs that up now that as someone who has an unusual name, a non-British, a non-anglicized name, if you like, you typically have to put in twice as many applications uh, to get the same number uh, of interviews. Now I experienced that very, very early on in my career. Ultimately, I was able to qualify almost 20 years ago, but as I entered the profession and I meandered my way uh, across various law firms, so I worked as a corporate lawyer uh, for four law firms, the bulk of my clients were within financial services. I had a number of insurance clients, for example, and I really enjoyed the transactional work, uh, but I noticed that I was the only black solicitor at the first firm that I joined, at the second firm that I joined, at the third firm, and then at the fourth firm. And you slowly begin to realize that something else is at play here. My career was progressing quite nicely. Um, and then I had my son, you know, I was married at the time and I was in my late twenties, we had a baby. I had no concept about how maternity leave was going to affect my return to work. Of course, it was a massive shock to the system, uh, returning to work more so as I seem to have missed the memo from all the other uh, female fee earners, uh, as we called ourselves at the time, uh, who decided to delay having children until they became a partner. You know, there was a very strategic uh, career plan around that. And I, I'd had my son as a, a very junior solicitor. I was only two years qualified. So it had tremendous impact when I came back to work because I was the only female fee earner in that age bracket, uh, you know, certainly the only one with a baby. And there was no support and very little understanding and flexible working wasn't going to work out. And I couldn't do the long, you know, working through the night as I had been able to do before I'd had my son. And it ultimately led to me leaving the central London law firms for, for regional law firms where I was able to balance my career a bit more. But again, I thought all I've done is had a baby, you know, millions of women do this every year. Why is there such a high penalty attached? And I do remember being very, very angry for the first five or six years of my son's life uh, because I loved working in central London and I felt angry that I'd had to move out of central London to regional practices uh, to maintain some level of balance. Uh, but I did then go on to enjoy a very, very successful career uh, within regional law firms. Um, and in 2012, a wonderful opportunity came up uh, with Roche, uh, the world's largest biotech company. I spent almost seven years uh, with Roche progressing uh, throughout my career and to more and more senior roles. Now, the irony was Roche is, a la is still the largest biotech, very complex global organization that employs over 100,000 uh, people, by far my biggest employer to date. You would think that at that stage of my career, I might've had a few more challenges 
with balancing work and home. But ironically, it was so much easier to do that because I wasn't in a fee earning role. I wasn't in a position where I was having to sell uh, my services as, as a solicitor. I was working within industry and therefore uh, I didn't have the pressure to generate fees. So actually working for the world's largest biotech company meant that I had much more balance and control over my career, even though at this stage I was a C-suite leader and sitting on various leadership teams and making you know, wide reaching decisions for, for the staff group of 2000 employees with various leadership hats on. Uh, it was just quite interesting to me how it was much harder to balance work and home when I was generating fees, when I, I was working as a fee earner in various law firms. I spent almost seven years at Roche. I had a sabbatical uh, after the seven years. I decided um, not to return to Roche at that point in time because I wanted to explore different pharmaceutical company models and look at different ways in which I could add value uh, within the pharmaceutical industry. And I joined a, a company called Cycle Pharma, uh, which is based in Cambridge, uh, actually in Cambridge University, and built up very strong links with the academic community at Cambridge through that, that organization. And currently I'm coming to the tail end of MBA studies with Wharton Business School. Lockdown seems to have uh, coincided quite conveniently with my online studies. So I was going to be at home uh, anyway during this period. And alongside this, to embed my MBA learning, I started my own consultancy and I've been offering all sorts of services, mainly around culture, diversity and inclusion. But through my consultancy, I've also been advising on various clinical trials to do with COVID effort. I've been involved in the inequalities piece around COVID, some of the emerging data uh, about how uh, minority ethnic groups are disproportionately affected um, by, by COVID. So it's often a lot of flexibility but I'm also now interviewing uh, for permanent roles, again, ideally within the global pharmaceutical uh, industry. So that's a potted history of my career to date and where I'm at currently. And, you know, with a career that spanned 20 years, uh, it, I've been very reflective, especially during this COVID period. And I've learned some very important lessons that I want to share with you, because these lessons, again, have been born from that inter intersectionality. And you know, what have I learned over the years about leadership and how to really hone your leadership skills? The first lesson that I've learned is that the importance of focus, and that's never been more important than now with, with COVID in the media, and uh, there's so much noise and so much cause to panic and worry. And I found that actually maintaining that almost ruthless focus at times it's what's really, really helped to keep me sane. And I've advised many people around me uh, to limit their exposure to the news, actually, because I don't think uh, it's necessarily a, a healthy thing in the current environment. Uh, but staying focused is something that has really helped me to hone my leadership skills. Um, and that has come out of many, many years of experience uh, around uh, being easily distracted, I would say, very early on in my career. The second thing is standing out from the crowd. I, I believe very strongly in visibility and your personal brand. Um, I, I maintain a consistent personal brand across all social media platforms, for example. Um, and I encourage people to really fine tune their skills as a leader. What is it about you that really makes you stand out? What makes you a unique proposition? This has been another key element to my success uh, as a leader. And ironically, having had my unusual name be such an issue when I was entering the profession now, my name is unusual um, and it makes me stand out and people remember me. They never forget uh, my name. There are no other from Kevin Bollis, for example, uh, who are solicitors. I'm the only one. I checked on the Law Society's uh, uh, role of solicitors. I'm the only one out of almost 200,000 uh, solicitors. So, Honing my skills and, and looking at what makes me really stand out has been pivotal uh, for my success and another key learning over the last 20 years. The third thing is to keep learning. Now, this is something I take very, very seriously. Um, I'm always reflecting on, on lessons learned and I keep learning in a very structured way. I mean, the, the MBA studies during my sabbatical, I studied extensively around a number of uh, business topics, again, with a view to upping my game even further. Uh, as a senior leader. So this growth mindset uh, is very, very important for us as leaders. We really need to be mindful that everything is a learning experience and we must embrace that 
as leaders. Supporting others. Now, this is about mentoring. This is about role modeling. This is about sponsoring people for opportunities, um, assisting those who are looking to you as an example. I've uh, had so much joy from seeing mentees grow and flourish over the years, often lacking confidence when they first meet me. And I love maximizing that potential and, and you know, helping to people to, to open up and to realize uh, the potential they have within. So this is another core part of leadership development is how do you support the pipeline? What are you doing? And I would really encourage you to challenge yourselves around this one because it's so key to developing your leadership style. Uh, supporting that pipeline of diverse talent is really, really key. And this is the final lesson I've learned. And this is where I, I like to keep it real, uh, to be very realistic, because as we all know, you can do everything right and it can still go badly wrong. I have so many examples of opportunities that should have landed in my lap and didn't. Um, I have so many instances of situations that were blatantly unfair. Despite best efforts, uh, things don't always pan out uh, the way that one would hope. And again, this is a tough leadership lesson to learn. You know, you become very resilient and you just learn over time to keep calm and believe that tomorrow is another day and things can and will improve and you just have to keep at it. So it would be most disingenuous of me not to mention this final tip as well. And you begin to see why diversity is so important. Uh, you know, I, I sort of, uh, with the intersectionality, it covers so many different diversity strands. A lot of people find it very hard to know where to place me. You know, I'm a black woman, um, very, very well educated, privately educated, uh, upper middle class background. I'm a mother also, I'm a solicitor, uh, I'm a healthcare executive. You know, there are all these different labels, I'm on television, etc., etc. There's so many strands uh, that, that define who I am. And it's so important for me to see others maximizing their potential, whether or not you're from an underrepresented group. I firmly believe um, that your potential should be harnessed and realized. And this is a good example of one of the projects. There are many projects I've been involved in over the years, uh, but I got involved uh, in a social mobility project that actually led on this and got a number of friends to give their time for free. Um, and we interviewed a number of senior leaders in law, got lots of data to show that social mobility, you know, there are real challenges in the legal profession. And this report, which is freely available online, by the way, so if you do a Google search, you'll be able to find it, is full of heartfelt stories from senior judges, uh, law firm partners, all of whom were born uh, into a working class background and despite that have gone on to progress. And ultimately, this report made its way to the House of Lords. Uh, it shaped uh, the government's work around uh, social mobility in the professions more broadly. I got to meet uh, Alan Milburn, who was leading a, a commission around social mobility and does a lot of work in this area. And I'm incredibly proud of the work we did around this because it led to a lot of law firms finally addressing uh, the, the challenge around social mobility uh, in the legal profession. And I've had the pleasure of meeting uh, Prime Minister. So I met Theresa May twice when she was Prime Minister, uh, again with my diversity hat on. I was invited to number 10 on two separate occasions. Uh, one occasion was to talk about apprenticeships and uh, young people and work opportunities for them. And the second occasion was uh, around women returning uh, to work. You won't be surprised to hear that she reached out to me on that. I was very vocal about the issue at the time. Um, and I know a number of people are very, very critical of politicians and we only hear aspects of what they do really in the news. But I actually can't commend Theresa May enough for what she did uh, around diversity, often behind the scenes, unfortunately, and wasn't publicised um, enough. The other lady is Liz Truss, who at the time was Secretary of State for Justice. I met her on three separate occasions uh, during a very, very short eight month uh, tenure as Justice Secretary. Uh, and she supported my initiatives in all sorts of ways. She spoke at an International Women's Day uh, event uh, that I was hosting for a women's network that I'd helped to co-found with some friends and cleared her diary. In fact, she told me as she arrived that she'd had to turn down uh, a meeting with the Prime Minister to prioritise my event uh, and was fantastic at the event and very, very supportive 
I advised her uh, and the government around the judiciary and how we can make the, the judges at senior levels more diverse. And those then became recommendations uh, that were published next week, which was remarkable. Uh, so these two female politicians who, you know, we don't always hear great things about, um, have personally been of a positive impact in my diversity journey and have, you know, really spearheaded or sponsored um, fantastic opportunities uh, for people from underrepresented groups from my experience. And this is a very recent development. Uh, I've been involved with this APPG for a couple of years, uh, but I recently joined the business committee uh, because I wanted to be able to represent the uh, pharmaceutical uh, sector predominantly uh, with a view to seeing what we can do to improve uh, diverse leadership at, at senior levels. Uh, so this is a parliamentary group, um, cross party, uh, and we're doing some really, really interesting work and you'll be hearing more about the APPG uh, over time. There'll be some really good announcements coming out before the end of this year. But I haven't forgotten about doctors. So as I said, I'm surrounded by doctors um, and many of my family members work for the NHS and been involved in the COVID efforts. So it's been a very, very real lived experience uh, for me. Uh, my father very sadly died uh, over a year, just over eight years ago now. And in his memory, uh, I decided to establish a medical scholarship for him uh, in 2016. The scholarship's now in its uh, fifth year. In fact, uh, applications closed yesterday, so I was spending time yesterday sifting through the over 70 outstanding applications that we've received this year to try and work out who out of these exceptional medical students uh, is going to get uh, the main scholarship award this year. But it's been wonderful uh, to see the cohort of 18 students so far um, many of whom are now doctors, we've got six doctors now out of that cohort and hopefully we'll have another cohort uh, coming through uh, from this year's uh, application. So I haven't forgotten about future doctors and I do a lot of work uh, with junior, junior doctors and, and junior talent in the medical field generally. And it's interesting what happens when you're just doing what you think is right. Um, I didn't actually really think what I was doing was extraordinary, which sounds very odd. Uh, given the breadth of the activity I was involved in, but I was just doing my bit. Uh, but when you're doing your bit with passion and, and you know, integrity with steam, uh, you might suddenly get a Queen's Honour. Uh, and this happened uh, just over three years ago. Extraordinary, very, very surreal experience uh, meeting Prince Charles and uh, receiving an MBE. Uh, I never in my wildest dreams uh, anticipated that this was even possible for me. So that was wonderful and of course has elevated uh, my work even further. I had an interesting chat uh, with the Prince of Wales about uh, Brexit, funnily enough, and I, I, I suggested that he held another Commonwealth reception. He used to hold these receptions very regularly and had stopped doing them. I said it'd be great, you know, if you could hold another reception because the Commonwealth is going to be very important with Brexit and very cheeky really of me to be saying this, but it would appear that he actually listened to me because <laughs> By October of the next year, I was meeting him again at a Commonwealth reception at Clarence House. Uh, he remembered me. I showed him the picture of my investiture and he said, I do remember you because you had such a, you know, your purple dress. Everything was so uh, unusual. You know, your outfit. I would never forget that head tie, he said to me. So uh, wonderful. I have huge respect for, for the Prince of Wales, of course. He does a tremendous amount of work uh, with young people, the Prince's Trust and so on. Uh, and is very, very charming, I must say, and has an incredible sense of humour. Uh, so that, you know, you know, you have to be careful what you say to people and suggest, because they might then invite you uh, to receptions to meet them again. But wonderful experience. And I'll finish with a quote. Uh, Denzel Washington's uh, my favourite actor. It's, it's something that anyone who's close to me uh, will know. And uh, this really epitomises my leadership and why I do what I do. At the end of the day, it's not about what you have or even what you've accomplished. It's about what you've done with those accomplishments. It's about who you've lifted up, who you've made better. It's about what you've given back. And on that note, I'll close. Very happy to keep in touch. All my contact details are there, including my website. And I think we can hand over now for questions, can't we, Zoe?
You're still on mute, Zoe, so you'll need to unmute. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you, thank you so much. You covered a huge raft of different challenges, issues, um, and some huge achievements. Um, and so I'd just like to cover a few points with you, and then we'll go to Andrew, who's going to be hosting the Q&A through the web chat box. Um, obviously, we talked. you talked about intersectionality and a fairly new definitional term that's being um, used in terms of looking at the multitude of layers of identity, which you, you harnessed exceptionally well through your presentation. But in terms of, um, you have the seen and the unseen impacts of this, um, and you did talk about all the different hurdles and not a level playing field. So how did it really impact you? I mean, I know you said about the determination and ruthless focus, but how has this impacted you in your career, but also helped to shape the, the approach to your leadership? Yes, I think being a solicitor and, and being an officer of the court, you know, we, we actually are officers of the court, you know, justice and fairness is at the heart of, of, of having qualified as a solicitor in terms of my first career. And so I have a heightened sense of that and a much broader sense of what that means beyond legal practice itself. You know, I've, I've seen that uh, organisations benefit hugely um, from truly harnessing the diversity uh, within them and, and often they need help in doing that so you know I appreciate that mm. it's not always easy but I chose to not be bitter about my experiences mm. it would be very easy to uh, be consumed by bitterness I was very angry as I admitted earlier mm. for a number of years because these hurdles were unforeseen uncalled for you know why why should it even matter um, and a friend of mine said to me the other day that look at what the world would have missed out on had you not qualified, you know, had you not actually uh, gotten your foot in the door, you know, look at the impact you've had. And I thought that's, that's the case for so many people that, you know, we all have potential that, that won't be harnessed or realised unless we're given a level playing field. So I, I, I harnessed my, I, I channeled my anger in a more productive way uh, rather than being bitter and consumed by the bitterness that you know comes from the unfairness of it all really so yeah <laughs> yeah uh, and you, you also I mean you talked obviously about a lot of sacrifice um, and all the effort you put in but also there's obviously the preconceptions of being a black female but also the cultural aspects and elements and also the pressures to perform from your parents as well your father and the family so you had you've had both um, the impact from the external um, in sort of career um, pressure, but also family pressure. Uh, how did you deal with that? Because there are preconceptions about privilege and social mobility. So what are your, how have you dealt with that? And what is your advice on, it, on navigating it? Yes. I now, I mean, I'm much older now. Obviously, when I was a teenager, maybe I didn't appreciate this as much. I didn't appreciate the privilege. I, I thought everyone went to private school. I mean, it's bizarre that I ever thought that. Um, I thought everyone's parents supported them. You know, again, that was another thing that I assumed everybody had. And of course, I realized very quickly that wasn't the case. But the pressure is, is a good point to pick up on. Um, parental pressure is, is a, a motivator. Um, I didn't want to let my dad down because he was investing a huge amount in me. But I suppose the way I balanced uh, maybe some of the downsides of the pressure was that you know, he was very supportive with it. You know, he was very, very proud uh, of me and what I was doing and how hard I was working. And he was uh, always so, so happy to see me thrive and always believed that I would thrive. You know, having said, he expected me to become one of the top lawyers in the country. He then said, I have every confidence that you will become one of the top lawyers in the country. Aww. So it, it, it was wonderful to have that counterbalance really to the pressure. I suppose in terms of societal stereotypes, that's probably been a, a lot harder to navigate. Um, the number of people who have been surprised by the way I speak, who have commented on how articulate I am because it surprised them that I'm articulate. Um, they're, they're surprised when I say that, you know, I'm the third generation of graduates in my family. My son will be the fourth generation. My, you know, my grandfather's 
studied at Durham. I mean, it's, it's something that for, for some who haven't been exposed to someone who's black from an upper middle class background, it's very difficult for, for some people to get round, their heads around it. My mom's a psychiatrist and talks about cognitive dissonance all the time, which is when, you know, the, the mind literally cannot compute um, because something's happening that's not within lived experience. So I've had to deal with a lot of that, you know, lots of the preconceptions around black women and, and black mothers and being a single mother since my divorce. Again, that led to another raft of uh, assumptions being made when actually I get on very well with my ex-husband and he's, you know, played a really important role in my son's life. Again, that doesn't fit in with the stereotype for some. Mm. So that's where more of the pressures come from, Zoe, if I'm honest with you, unless... The parental yeah. pressure actually was a positive thing for me. Good. Uh, you, I mean, you, re you just talked about um, become, being a mother and having to balance, you talked during your presentation about um, maternity leave and obviously becoming a mother sooner than the other female ladies within the law firm who had become partner mm -hmm. first. Um, this is a huge issue for industry as a whole. Um, and how what would your advice be to companies that are experiencing women leave, leaving to have children and having maternity leave we obviously now have pater, paternity leave as well mm -hmm. but then actually being able to bring them back um to the environment and enable them to work in a far more balanced area because you obviously shifted careers completely to I do did. that i did I think what I would say to companies is that we're now managing the expectations of a whole new generation. Um, I had a, a male, a very young male solicitor uh, I was mentoring four years ago, it made me realize this really is about gender equality. It's not just about the women being supported to come back. It's also the fathers. And this young man was in despair because he was leaving early to pick his, her, his daughter up. Uh, from nursery and lying that he was meeting clients and you know it was nothing of the sort. Uh, his wife was a surgeon working long hours erratic shifts and and therefore he was the one who had to have more regular hours and made me realize that there's a whole generation of young men who want to have a far more hands-on role. He didn't want to become a partner yet there was an assumption that he wanted to become a partner at that law firm. So we're not only losing out potentially on the female talent, we could find ourselves with a very disenfranchised group of young men also who want to be hands-on dads, who, who want to have uh, the parental leave. And making parental leave far more equal is important. It's far too heavily biased in favour of whoever's had the child at the moment. There's a, quite a high penalty attached to the person who hasn't had a child, um, being the one, you know, partaking of parental leave and the, the law and other considerations need to change around that. But it is about gender equality, Zoe. It's not just a simple case of focusing on the women and encouraging them. We've got to get men involved in the childcare, you know, the home. I wrote a blog about this recently, about how I've got my son very involved in housework from a very young age. Um, it's so important. It is so important that we share that uh, across across genders and not just have women be the ones who expect it uh, to, to carry everything, really. It's key. Thank you. And one very brief question, because we've got a lot coming in through the chat box. So after this, I'll hand over to you, Andrew. Um, in turn, you mentioned a lot about um, developing the talent of the future and the continual learning that you've gone through and that growth mindset. Um, how, do you, how have you challenged your mentees and, and how, what have you got out of being a mentor? It's been an incredible journey being a mentor and continues to be. I, I start with uh, self-awareness, raising self-awareness. Um, I've uh, become ultra self-aware over the years and I use Myers-Briggs. I'm very, very uh, vocal advocate of the Myers-Briggs type indicator um, because I find it's a very comprehensive way of understanding your preferred styles and ways of being. And I, I use Myers-Briggs with, with all my mentees. I have very young students at school who are 16 who now know their Myers-Briggs profile and what that means for them. And 
it's, it's been a revelation for them to understand this is why I'm the way that I, I am and that's why I don't get on so well with that person. And these are aspects of me that I can try and modify to, to, to sort of maximize the potential of us all as a, as a collective group. Uh, my son did Myers-Briggs quite by accident. He didn't realize it was Myers-Briggs when he was about 14. And it revolutionized, you know, a task they were doing as a team uh, at school because he came home complaining constantly that, you know, people were pulling their weight. And he's a very, very strong, uh, high, very extroverted character. Um, and through self-awareness, he learned that actually he wasn't allowing the more reflective members of the team to talk. You know, he was going in there and uh, dominating everything. And they became much more effective as a team. So the self-awareness piece has been wonderful. I've learned uh, a lot about myself uh, from young people. I, I learned just as much from them as they do uh, from me. And I have a number of reverse mentoring relationships uh, where um, they advise me, you know, on challenges that I'm facing, which is very refreshing. Again, that's the you know, whole growth mindset, as you say, Zoe, is so key and has undoubtedly harnessed me as a, as a leader. I think I'm a much better leader for having had these wonderful relationships. Thank you, Funky. Andrew, over to you in the chat box. Yes, indeed. Thank you very much indeed. So we've had a few questions come in. Um, I'll start with the first one from Clarissa Farr, and it's for Funky. Do you think women specifically bring different strengths to the challenges of leadership? I do. I think the fact that women are biologically programmed to to carry a human life you know <laughs> and all that goes with that we tend to be and i have to be very careful with how i choose my words here because uh it's a bit of a generalization but we tend to be the nurturers we tend to be naturally more empathetic as leaders and we tend to prioritize uh, kindness, you know, we're a lot more concerned about how we appear to others and can be a lot more self-critical. Now, there needs to be balance around that, obviously, in leadership, but women can be a lot more self-aware because of that. And as I mentioned earlier, self-awareness is a really important part of harnessing your skills as a leader. We've seen with COVID uh, that many of the uh, countries where that are run by women, you know, where it's a, a female premier, have coped far better with the challenge of COVID than where that's not the case. And Jacinda Arden is one of the shining examples. And she's admitted that people in the past said to her that she was too kind, too compassionate, too empathetic, not assertive enough. Well, actually, you can see now how kindness uh, is, is a really important leadership trait. And I think, you know, Women, because of our genetic programming, I think we, we tend to be far more empathetic than men. I'm not saying that I haven't worked with some exceptionally empathetic male leaders, uh, but I do think that women, uh, that comes more naturally to us. And that's something that we can't miss out on uh, in the business world. Excellent question then. Thanks very much for asking it. Excellent, thank you. Next question is from Michelle O'Sullivan, and it's probably two parts, but basically she's very interested in your views on diversity quotas, and there's been a sub-question coming about, should those quotas be legally enforced? Mm. So I have an issue with quotas uh, as compared with targets. Um, quotas are mandated, you know, they are legally enforced, and there are very real consequences legally if you don't uh, meet the quota. And that's the big difference between a quota and a target. Um, unfortunately, what happens with quotas, it, it can lead to all sorts of uh, resentments. And when people are, uh, you know, achieve a position, you know, is it because they were filling a quota? Or was it because they could actually do the role? Uh, when you look at case studies around that, that's a real concern when you're looking at quotas. I'm fully in favor of targets because we all have targets in, in the business world. You know, we all have goals, objectives. You sit down with your boss at the beginning of the year and you plan what it is you're going to aiming to achieve. And then at the end of the year, you have a performance review um, and, and you're measured against the targets that you've agreed earlier on that year. 
And I'm fully in favor of targets because we all need something that we're working towards. Uh, what doesn't get uh, measured doesn't get done. So not having a goal to work towards around diversity and inclusion uh, means that we don't move further forwards. Um, I don't think it should be mandated though. I think there should be transparency around the targets uh, and that leads to accountability for the organization. And there should be firm commitment to meeting the target and having an action plan uh, to make sure the target is met. So hugely in favor of targets, not a huge fan of quotas. Fantastic. Um, now, frankly, we've got a lot of questions coming in. So um, if you'd be really grateful, just keep your answers a little bit shorter because we do have sure, a lot to I get through. Do. I do I apologize for that. Not at all. Um, so Karen Barnett has, uh, has asked, um, Funky, I'm interested to hear how you guide your son through the challenges that he may face as a young black man navigating the world. Yes. So I have been very open with my son about the challenges. He's been to many of my talks. He's been to Parliament with me. Uh, he is very aware of the challenges he's going to face. And I support him, as does his father, in maximising his potential. Uh, and he's confident, self-assured because of that. But he's got his eyes wide open. I'm keeping the answers short, Andrew, if you want to get into trouble. Uh, but yes, that's how we've achieved that with our son. Fantastic. Um, okay, so James Harrison has asked, um, how would you suggest that societal demographics should be considered when exploring diversity? How do you suggest organisations ensure equality for all and do not lean towards positive discrimination in their attempts to increase representation of minority groups? Mm. This is a tricky one because I do think that we need some form of positive discrimination in certain instances. I think that, for example, if you're trying to increase, you know, the law firms who've been successful in increasing uh, their minority uh, intakes, you know, in, train in terms of trainees, have only achieved that by, pos you know, make making sure they prioritize those applications, you know, all things being equal, they've had a target in mind and they've made sure that they've encouraged as many applicants from minority ethnic background as possible. So there's an element of positive discrimination there without a doubt. I don't believe you should be compromising on quality because of that. So saying positive discrimination doesn't mean you're compromising on quality. We must remember that the playing field is not currently level and that's why we're having to do all these things to redress the balance. Great stuff, thank you. Um, the Anna Crump asked, and it's something which you touched on earlier, but it's actually, I think, such a fundamental or very important point that um, I'm going to put it back into the question slots. And it's about, um, you know, she says, you talked about having a difficult period in your career after having your son. And sadly, I think that experience is one shared by others even now. What are some of the things that businesses should do to ensure the experience of working days, labor, so after having children is easier to, and fairer? Uh, plus the granite sets. Can somebody please unmute themselves? Yeah. We're getting some very interesting business commentary from yeah. someone. There. <laughs> yeah, so basically that would go back to, um, frankly, back to the idea of, you know, it is, we see a lot in the recruitment world, you know, is how um, basically particularly many women, but how businesses can ensure the experiences of working after children is easier and fairer. This goes back to the sharing the responsibilities and encouraging both parents uh, or as broad a range of carers as possible uh, to be involved in, in child rearing and, and housework and everything uh, that goes with that. It's about true gender equality. It's about supporting the young men also and the men uh, and the fathers who want to be a part of this. It's making it easier for them uh, to take on the share, uh, their fair share of the responsibilities at home. Uh, so it's the gender equality piece. I think that's a trick that a lot of employers are missing currently is empowering the men actually to be able to make those decisions also. Okay, thank you. Uh, Sean Taylor, he asked, um, great chat, thank you. Are you worried that COVID-19 has knocked diversity off the agenda and some firms are perhaps using uh, COVID-19 to stop the focus? It depends. So culture has become very important uh, with organisations as a result of covid uh, and we've all seen some great examples of organizations that have done right 
by their staff. And there have been many examples where that's not been the case. Uh, and, and, and staff don't forget those sorts of things. You know, our memories are long <laughs> as employees. So I think that culture has been brought to the fore. I hear more and more anecdotal evidence about diversity and inclusion being discussed more broadly at C-suite level, uh, being part of the board pack, being something that investors want to see measured. What concerns me then, this is the big but, is this whole pressure of returning back to the office is something that I hadn't anticipated would happen in, in its current form. I, I still thought that there'd be some flexibility around the number of days, but there seems to be a real push to get as many people back into offices full time as possible. And that could be a real issue for some, you know, who have appreciated the flexibility that has come with COVID. So yes and no is the, is the answer to that question. Yeah. Perfect. Um, now we're going to be wrapping, I think, shortly, Zoe. So I'll just do some final questions and keep them brief. Is that okay? That's perfect. All right. Um, so Chris Cave asks, um, basically about um, schools and colleges, what can they do more of to attack the root causes of a lack of diversity? Um, massive subject, start, I know. But yeah, it is massive, to sum <laughs> that up. Um, having a very broad uh, talent pool that you're actually... Um, you know, of applicants, uh, you know, so, you know, Target Oxbridge and other initiatives like that are really, really key and have directly uh, increased the minority um, ethnic intake uh, for Oxbridge. And lots of other universities are doing this, uh, similar types of things. Within university itself, inclusion is very important. So supporting the student networks, uh, education, you know, Black History Month and raising awareness of the issues and acknowledging that racism even exists. Uh, sounds obvious, but sometimes, you know, that can be a struggle in itself. Those are sort, some of the things that schools and, and universities can be doing to, to improve the lot, the, the experience of students across the board. Fantastic. And, and I guess probably final question, if I may. Um, this is coming from separately, but over the weekend, there was a small Twitter controversy about the singer Adele and a photograph of her in dreadlocks. What is Funky's view on the role of celebrities in promoting diversity, or do they risk falling foul of cultural appropriation? I think cultural appropriation needs to be seen in context. I had no issue with Adele doing this. She's from Tottenham. I mean, you know, she, I just find, I found the reaction with that bizarre. I really, really did. You know, most of her close friends are black. She understands the experience of black people. Um, I didn't see this as being cheeky or, or any, any, anything of that nature. It's the context that's important, I think, in, in which this is done and not the person who's doing it. All celebrities are role models, uh, but I had no problem with Adele doing this at all. I honestly can't understand what the fuss is about. OK, thank you. Uh, and that, that concludes the open Q&A section. Thank, thank you. you, Andrew. And thank, thank you. Thank you ever so much. Um, just in terms of summing up, is there any points that you would just like to add as some closing comments before we close down the webinar? I suppose it's that we all keep an open mind, um, that we never stop uh, raising awareness around these issues. You know, we never stop educating ourselves around these issues. Um, and and to not put so much burden on those who are living the experience, because it's a huge burden to have to explain what it's like to be black, female, a mom, and so on. There's so much literature and there's a lot you can read around these issues. But just taking up the mantle in whichever way you feel is appropriate for you, just do something. I think my final word would be please, please do something uh, to improve and drive change uh, in this area. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, I'd like to thank again everyone um, who's attended um, and I hope that everyone's found this session interesting and informative. Um, we will be sending out a feedback survey so we'd be very grateful for everyone's comments who's attended. Um, lastly, on behalf of Dr. Frankie Abambola and Hanover, um, we'll welcome the opportunity to follow up with the discussion with all of you um, and your organisations. Um, so thank you ever so much for everyone attending. I think we've done very well to get through everything that we have. So thank you, thank you, um, thank you. for being so uh, succinct and articulate. <laughs> um, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so on that note, we'll close the meeting. Thank you ever so much, everyone. Thank, thank you. you thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.